Good evening and welcome to this latest uh, edition, the Elephant Conversations. And today it's my pleasure to be joined by Mr. Matt uh, Bryden. Uh, Matt Bryden, uh, I first met Matt when he was uh, coordinator of the United Nations Monitoring Group on Somalia and Eritrea uh, between 2008 and 2012. He's a former Canadian military officer and now, now strategic advisor to Sahan Research uh, Limited, which focuses on the Horn of Africa. Uh, welcome to the elephant, uh, Matt. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure. Great. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'll jump straight into it. Um, you know, the the Horn of Africa seems to be in turmoil. Now, it's it's always been a rough neighborhood, but you know, with events in Somalia, uh, Ethiopia, it really feels as if this is a quite a difficult time for uh, for the Horn of Africa. But I wanted to to ask um, to have a discussion with you. You know, you, it's a subject that you looked into very closely when working for the United Nations. Uh, and I know you continue to follow it from as a strategic advisor at Sahan Research, which is Eritrea. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's one of the more, the, one of the quietest in a sense, African countries, uh, a country from which we don't hear very much. Uh, we read about refugees fleeing from there, but we have heard a lot about Eritrea being involved um, in the region, in Ethiopia, Somalia, etc. And um, this you know, small country um, that we don't know very much about, um, you know, seems to be, have a disproportionate role uh, in geopolitical events in the region. Can you just give us a bit of history um, regarding uh, the Eritrean regime um, for people who, uh, as I said, we don't know, it's, it doesn't come up uh, in the public imagination when you're thinking about Africa very much. Give us a brief history of, of, of Eritrea, Matt. Well, um, to keep to the modern era, I mean, Eritrea is really, um, I think, one of the, the great tragedies of this part of the world. Um, Eritrea is the product of a very long and storied history of um, uh, the ancient civilizations of the Horn of Africa and uh, a period of colonization uh, by Italy. And then um, despite aspirations for independence, uh, annexation um, in a federation with Ethiopia, which, which turned sour. And then a really 30 year struggle for, for independence. And um, it's a beautiful country. Uh, it is uh, very strategically positioned on the Gulf of Aden um, and the Bab al Mandeb leading to the Red Sea. Uh, it has um, a history of struggle and determination and its people are um, incredibly determined and proud of, of their nationhood. Um, it's a, it, it should have been a success story. And in 1991, Eritrea was, uh, was, was liberated through the efforts of what was then called the, Tigre uh, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front and its allies from the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front. Uh, and that led to a referendum in 1993 uh, in which the Eritrean people overwhelmingly um, voted uh, for independence. And the, because the EPLF in Eritrea and the TPLF um, in Ethiopia, which was the, the dominant party at the time, because they had been allies during the war, uh, they had an understanding. And so the new Ethiopian government um, headed by the TPLF um, accepted and endorsed the decision of the Eritrean people to separate and exercise self-determination. And uh, so Eritrea became an independent country and drew up a constitution, which was ratified by a constituent assembly in, in 1997. Uh, its president was Isaias Afewerki, 
who had been the leader of the EPLF during the, during the struggle for liberation. And um, for the first few years, Eritrea was an exciting new um, member of the, uh, uh, the African community and uh, took, its, took its place in the African Union, uh, challenged uh, what it, what uh, Saya Safawarki then considered to be a club of complacent dictators. Um, and he rattled cages and said, Africa has to be better. Uh, we have to be more innovative, more progressive, and um, sort of set a tone that was shared by other new leaders on the continent, Ethiopia's Mela Zanawi, uh, Rwanda's Paul Kagame, uh, who came shortly afterwards, uh, Tabo, uh, Nelson Mandela and Tabo Mbeki subsequently in South Africa. This is what uh, some observers called Africa's renaissance and um, Eritrea was supposed to be part of it. Uh, but then um, in 1998, Ethiopia and Eritrea engaged in a, a catastrophic war, uh, ostensibly a border war, but it was actually about many other things including the relations between the leaders, um, decisions about their economic relationship, and uh, a certain amount of geopolitical rivalry. And at that point, um, President Isaias Afewerki took the opportunity of uh, the, the state of war to, um, let's say, suspend the implementation of Eritrea's constitution and to rule um, as an autocrat for the purposes of saving the Eritrean nation. Uh, the war ended inconclusively. Uh, there was uh, a disputed boundary that remained um, under international arbitration. It was then uh, much of the, the land that was disputed was awarded to Eritrea. Uh, Eritrea was supposed to compensate Ethiopia for, for losses incurred during the war, but the process remained frozen. And for Eritrea, the results were catastrophic because uh, Isaya Safawarki never relaxed the state of, uh, of war uh, that uh, had, had existed during the two years of conflict and uh, claimed that until the border issues were resolved, uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea were still essentially at war. And um, the constitution remained suspended and he remained um, very clearly a dictator. And that prompted some of his peers in the EPLF, people who had fought the struggle and were highly respected, had been uh, very close associates of his, uh, a group that was known as the G15, top EPLF officials, to challenge him in uh, 2001 and to say, we have to implement the constitution. We have to move forward towards a dem democratic system. And 11 of them who were in the country were uh, apprehended, detained, and never seen again. Four who were outside the country uh, survived and remained outside. But since that time, Eritrea has remained um, an entirely closed um, nation. What, what observers, analysts have referred to often as a garrison state or a battalion state. Um, and it is ruled um, almost entirely unilaterally uh, at the whim of Isaias Afewerki. And so its internal politics and its foreign policy orientations are really the expression of one man and uh, his advisors and supporters. It's a very small circle of people and a very dysfunctional system. If, if I can ask uh, Matt, how has Isaiah Safawaki has been able to, to hold on for so long. I mean, you've mentioned some of, uh, uh, some of the trends and tendencies that, you know, that he's used in terms of uh, alienating uh, a large proportion of the leaders who were around him when he took power, so some who, who disappeared. But that's now, um, you know, uh, decades of, 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 of holding on, um, no. How has you know what's what's it like uh, in 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 Eritrea itself? You said this was a you know um, 
you know, as, as Athoraki was considered, I think Susan Rice described them as the new breed of African leaders, Kagame, Museveni, Kabila, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, a time of, of some excitement, uh, at least in Washington, about this group of leaders. Uh, but how, 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 you know, it seems uh, curious that a single individual uh, like Mr., like President Athoraki can be able to keep a country under such a tight grip uh, that you know, we continuously read about um, refugees, young people fleeing um, Eritrea uh, through some very, very difficult routes trying to get to Europe and other parts of the world. Um, what's, what's the machinery of, of keeping this country under such a tight group? That's a really good question. And I, I'm not sure any of us who are uh, outside the system can really claim to fully understand it. Um, but um, in Eritrea, words that we take for granted um, when we talk about most other countries like government and party and military really have very different meanings. And what Isaias Afewerki has succeeded in doing is to essentially deconstruct all of the institutions that would normally govern a country uh, in order to exercise personal rule. So what does that mean? Um, it, it means first and foremost that what we call a government in Eritrea is really nothing but a shell. Uh, there are ministries, there are offices, and they do, um, the, these uh, ministries do manage um, services under the auspices of the state, like education, like um, healthcare and water, um, but they're not particularly effective. And so Eritrea is constantly suffering shortages of one thing or the other. Um, it's uh, agricultural extension schemes have been uh, uh, work in progress for 30 years. And um, the ministers themselves are really disempowered. It, you will never hear really of a council of ministers meeting. Uh, the ministers just do what they are told to do and administer in a technocratic way, uh, whatever is within their powers to, to do. And so that since the government doesn't really um, operate as, an, as a normal government, the power lies with what we call the party. But what is the party, the, the People's Front for Democracy and Justice, or PFDJ, which is what the EPLF calls itself now uh, since, since independence? Well, the PFDJ doesn't function as a party either. Um, it doesn't have party congresses. It doesn't have um, regular meetings of various committees that you would expect, Central Committee, Executive Committee, decisions are not published for general consumption, effectively the party has been narrowed down to a handful of top officials around uh, Isaias Afewerki. So um, Yamane Gebra'ab, who is the um, head of political affairs of the party, is also in a sense the de facto foreign minister. And you'll almost never see the foreign minister abroad without Yamane by his side. Um, and Yamane has a, many other responsibilities that go far beyond uh, the foreign minister's remit. The economy of the, of the country is in the hands of the PFDJ's Economic Affairs Department, headed by um, Hegos Gebrehiwot or Hegos Kisha, and um, controls a, an empire of um, government and parastatal enterprises. There's virtually no private sector in Eritrea. Um, all enterprises are either controlled by the party or licensed by the party. And, um, and then you have uh, the intelligence services and the military. And those are really the instruments through which Isaias exercises control. But here again, um, the military is, um, according to uh, public publicly available figures, um, because of this state of no war, no peace between Ethiopia and Eritrea uh, since 1998, um, Eritrea has maintained a system of national service, 
which is essentially a conscript army. And these soldiers can be used for military or civilian purposes. But what it means is that um, according to public figures, Eritrea has the largest number uh, of soldiers per capita of any country in the world except North Korea. And if you tweak the figures one way or the other, depending on how you count the Eritrean population, some would say it actually exceeds North Korea. And these are conscripts who uh, are supposed to serve two years, but Eritrea's national service system actually um, holds people in indefinite um, control by the state. So um, its, its members can serve 10, 20 years or more uh, if the government deems that it's so. Now, the command, Eritrea is divided into, uh, depending on who you ask, four or five different sectors, each commanded by a senior general. And as in many uh, sort of post-Soviet armies, um, the military owns and manages um, parastatal enterprises. It has properties, it has farms, and it has uh, other assets. And so in a sense, the commander of each sector is like a warlord who controls that zone, uh, generates revenues for the military, um, and often indul indulges in um, illegal activities like contraband or people smuggling, arms smuggling. Um, and um, so balancing the interests of this very small group, half a dozen uh, generals or so, is also how uh, Isaias has managed to keep himself in power. So in a very real sense, you've got about, well, between half a dozen and a dozen party officials who matter in the grand scheme of things, and a similar number of military and intelligence officials. And the rest of the system is really um, embellishment, um, ornamental. And um, I mean, there's a lot more that we could say about it, but this is essentially how Eritrea functions. Um, one, of the, one of the realities that has become apparent from the time that uh, you were with the UN uh, is despite all of this, uh, this small, close North Korea-like country seems to exercise a disproportionate uh, political, geopolitical intelligence and military um, role. Its ability to project its influence in the Horn of Africa seems totally disproportionate to what would be you know, its, its sort of military, economic, political assets. And I wanted mm -hmm. to ask, you know, how is this? I mean, I, I recently, um, um, Asaya Sefawaki talking of uh, the, creating a Cushitic alliance or, or something like that. How, how has Eritrea been able to, um, you know, to, to exert this kind of really disproportionate influence? Or is it proportionate? Is it, is, is, is it a country, you know, much like North Korea that, that um, uh, would rather its people starve but it you know, maintains uh, an aggressive and uh, uh, influential posture in, in the region uh, because um, uh, it's, 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 it's clear that, for example, in, in Somalia and, and also in, in Ethiopia, um, Eritrea, uh, Eritrea's fingerprints of Ethiopia's, Eritrea's hand is very much apparent in developments in those uh, in those theaters? It's, it's a really, um, it's a very interesting question. And um, again, uh, part of the answer is, is um, speculation about how Esaias' mind works. Uh, but looking back at his track record, I mean, he's, he's clearly a, a very gifted strategist and ruthless in the implementation of uh, his strategy. And many aspects of what he seems to, to want for Eritrea have remained consistent for decades. Um, even ever since the, the uh, partnership between the EPLF and TPLF on the battlefield, uh, 
uh, Esaias seems to have viewed himself as, as the elder brother to Ethiopia's Melazanawi, mm -hmm. as the real guru of the liberation struggle and treated the TPLF, um, which then went on to govern Ethiopia under the auspices of the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, or EPRDF, as a kind of a junior partner, and um, tried to serve as a guide, as a, as a mentor to Melissa Now, among other things, I, I strongly suspect, having watched this period of history very closely, um, the two men found themselves in very different situations. Isaias governs a country of uh, estimates, say, between four and six million people, a strip of um, uh, quite much of it, quite difficult terrain on, on the uh, shores of the Gulf of Aden. Um, Melis found himself in charge of a country that at the time was estimated to have about 80 million people, um, the regional powerhouse. And um, he really had to make his own decisions and was not in a position to listen to anybody else about how he needed to operate to, to assert control over Ethiopia. And he and the party opted for a system of ethnic federalism. Uh, this was something that Esaias considered to be anathema uh, because like Ethiopia, Eritrea, comprises multiple ethnic groups. And um, the idea of dividing Eritrea between these groups and provinces dominated by these groups was utterly rejected by Esaias. And he appears to have been convinced that, that uh, Melis and his party were condemning Ethiopia to oblivion um, by taking an ancient empire and trying to manage it this way. So there was, there was some ideological friction, but then after the war in 1998 um, and a total rupture between the two leaders, uh, for a long time, Eritrea was isolated. Um, it was first very much weakened and damaged by this terrible border war. And then in 2007, it was accused by a number of governments of supporting the Somali terrorist group Al-Shabaab. And although the initial reports were exaggerated, uh, monitors said there were 2000 Eritrean troops in Mogadishu with the Islamic courts and then with Al-Shabaab and, um, and a number of other exaggerations, there were a small number of military advisors. Uh, but Eritrea was very much um, supportive of both the Islamic courts and Al-Shabaab and any other Somali movement uh, that was opposed to Ethiopia. So when the, the direct confrontation between Ethiopia and Eritrea stopped in 2000, a proxy war continued throughout the region and particularly in Somalia. And the links with Al-Shabaab uh, from Asmara resulted in Eritrea being placed under UN Security Council sanctions. Um, now, a lot's been made out of these sanctions that uh, they punished the Eritrean people and um, um, damaged the Eritrean economy. And frankly, that's nonsense. Um, there were never any active sanctions on Eritrea except an arms embargo. Uh, Eritrea was prohibited from um, importing or exporting weapons. It was prohibited from supporting armed groups throughout the Horn of Africa region. Um, especially Al-Shabaab, but the council said all armed groups. But um, the UN never designated any Eritrean officials for targeted sanctions, and there was no economic embargo, no restrictions on the Eritrean economy or on its transportation and financial services, nothing at all. Um, but this was a very handy propaganda tool for for Esaias and his, his team to say that the world was, was punishing them to try to turn it into a, an existential battle for survival with the United States and elevate Eritrea to a sort of strategic rival of the United States um, and to maintain the state of no war, no peace. Now the sanctions, what they did do was make um, Eritrea a pariah state. And so with a few exceptions, investors were very reluctant 
uh, to put money into Eritrea. And a lot of governments were shy of um, providing economic support because Eritrea uh, might misuse it for military purposes. And it was very active at that time, supporting armed groups, rebel groups in Ethiopia and other parts of the Horn of Africa and uh, in Somalia for a time. So Eritrea was in the eyes of the United States, Ethiopia and that geopolitical camp, uh, what they would have said, what they would have called contained. And in around 2011, 2012, when I was leading the UN's monitoring effort, we noticed a change in Eritrean policy. Um, either they were providing less support or no support to Al-Shabaab in Somalia. They continued to support other rebel groups in Ethiopia um, and, and elsewhere. But um, we, we came to the conclusion that either Eritrea had got the message and was reducing its support or was just getting better at hiding it and we were having a hard time finding it. But uh, either way, uh, evidence of Eritrean support for a terrorist group uh, was drying up. And the UN Security Council started to question the sanctions regime. And that's where Ethiopia's agenda was finally pushed to the fore, where the EPRDF government in Addis Ababa said, Eritrea needs to be contained. And if you maintain the, the sanctions on Eritrea, then we as Ethiopia perfectly content, we're satisfied with the status quo. We don't want war and we don't want a failed state on our borders. But if the UN Security Council lifts the sanctions, then we as Ethiopia will have no option but to unilaterally take action against Eritrea. So that kept the sanctions in place as a kind of warning of instability and insecurity in the region. Um, but after a few years, it simply wasn't a, um, um, a tenable situation. I would add that Eritrea was also sanctioned because of a border war with Djibouti. It was a very brief war, very few casualties, but Eritrea was accused of having taken Djiboutian territory, having taken Djiboutian prisoners, and refusing to provide any information about the prisoners of war. And in fact, denied that it held any. And then some prisoners of war escaped and started telling the story. And so it became clear that Eritrea was once again uh, producing a false narrative. So Djibouti also wanted uh, sanctions maintained on Eritrea. Um, so until about, well, until 2018, essentially Eritrea remained isolated and sanctioned, even if uh, the sanctions themselves were very light touch. Could the I, big change came when Abiy Ahmed became prime minister of Ethiopia. I was, yeah, I just and, I wanted to ask about that phase because they seem to have been a big reboot. And actually yeah. uh, Abiy Ahmed becomes prime minister of Ethiopia, uh, normalizes relations with, with Eritrea, yeah. wins the Nobel Prize, uh, partly, you know, largely as a result of that uh, uh, correction of relations and um, but now we find ourselves in uh, in the middle of uh, what seems to be building up into a fierce uh, conflict in Ethiopia and once again um, there, is, you know, there are reports of Eritrean troops in uh, in Tigray and uh, etc. Can you just you know, tell us about that, that period? 20, Abiy, Abiy, so Abiy Ahmed comes to power. What happens then? What does Eritrea do? Well, Abiy, Abiy Ahmed came to power as a result of um, unrest in Ethiopia under the EPRDF government. Um, and so, although he was a product of the EPRDF, he'd even been a, a military intelligence officer under the EPRDF and rose through the party's ranks to be chosen as prime minister. Um, he immediately cast himself as a reformer. And, and distance himself from the old regime and particularly uh, pointed the, the finger of blame at the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front um, who had dominated this scene. And he embarked on a series of initiatives that um, completely upended the situation in the Horn of Africa. And most, I think, observers believe for the better. He immediately reached out and announced uh, 
a peace deal with Eritrea, with the Saya Safawati. Um, the problem there is that the substance of the peace deal was never released, and it seems that there really wasn't any. It was more of a handshake and a statement in principle than any kind of genuine um, reconciliation between the two governments. Um, he also initially released political prisoners, and he welcomed back uh, armed groups that had opposed the, the former government, uh, most of them hosted by Eritrea and armed and trained in Eritrea. Um, but again, without really um, having any clear conditions for their return, their integration, their disarmament. Uh, so um, fighters flowed back into Ethiopia under a kind of general amnesty uh, and no clear plan for their integration. At that point, uh, Abiy Ahmed received the Nobel Prize uh, for peace. And the UN Security Council lifted sanctions on Eritrea. And that's really when Eritrea, um, or Isaias himself personally, um, emerged as a regional actor to be reckoned with. Um, most would say that from that point onwards, he served in a capacity as a mentor to Abiy Ahmed, uh, just as he had wanted to mentor Mela Zanawi before him and Melis had turned away. Now he had a young charismatic leader um, who seemed um, ready to listen to uh, to Esaias's guidance and set to work. Um, it, it strongly appears to, I think, most of us, set to work dismantling the system of ethnic federalism that the EPRDF had built uh, in Ethiopia. Um, Esaias also um, reached out to President uh, Mohamed Abdullah Farmajo of Somalia and um, became a kind of uh, senior advisor or mentor to him as well. And to both these men, it's pretty clear that the message was, don't listen to these international, West, especially Western partners uh, of yours. They're not partners. Uh, they are neo-colonialists. This talk about democracy is nonsense. What, what we need are strong central governments. And Talk of elections is ridiculous. Esaias himself had been asked by Al in an Al Jazeera interview years earlier, so when are you gonna hold elections? To which his answer was, what elections? Um, and he said, maybe in 30, 40 years. So um, clearly the advice was, you don't have to be bound by these sort of democratic norms. And uh, we need strong men who can hold states together. And so both Abi Ahmed and Farmajo seem to have, in their own ways, taken paths, uh, parallel paths, to delay elections and then complicate, obfuscate uh, the circumstances under which elections were held and uh, acted as autocrats. Um, Somalia was also building a federal system, just as Ethiopia had been, and Farmajo too started to dismantle Somalia's federal system. And then these three governments got together and declared a trilateral alliance um, announced in Asmara. And that was a challenge, not just in terms of the national leadership of these countries, but it was a challenge to the regional uh, intergovernmental organization, IGAD, because it basically said IGAD's not relevant. Isaias quite openly argued that Kenya and Uganda had no business being in the Horn of Africa. They were East African. And so we needed something for the countries of the Horn. Uh, some called it a Cushitic alliance. Um, and um, the other challenge it represented was to the African Union, because Isaias uh, was dismissive of the African Union. And Abiy Ahmed in Ethiopia took his cue and rejected, uh, subsequently rejected African Union um, offers to, to mediate in Ethiopia's internal conflict. Um, Farmajo in Somalia talked about kicking African Union troops out of the country, even though his army wasn't ready to, uh, anywhere near ready to assume responsibility. And so this kind of club came together 
until the war in Tigray broke out last year. Mm. And and um, I, I I'm sorry that you know we're we're we you know time flies when uh, <laughs> when you have an interesting uh, subject and um, I'll be speaking to you later about uh, Ethiopia and we'll delve deeper into some of these uh, issues as they, are, as they have unfolded in Ethiopia and continue to unfold. Mm -hmm. so I just wanted to say for now, uh, Matt Bryden, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you, John, my pleasure.